It's my pleasure to be here. I'm Jerry Kenny. I'm an occupational therapist, like she said, and um, <clears throat> I have a specialty with driver rehab. And uh, as a therapist, I'd like to see as many people return to driving as possible after a brain injury or um, <clears throat> brain tumor. I'd like to preface my presentation by saying that someone with a brain tumor can have brain injury. So if it says brain injury here, just keep in mind that it may refer to you or not, depending on how you recovered after your surgery or treatment. So um, <clears throat> I had a PowerPoint, but it's, it's not coming up on this. So we have handouts, you can go along, and I'll just uh, <clears throat> start the presentation. Is there driving after brain injury? The answer is yes, and I'm glad to say most definitely. Yes, there is. Yeah, better. Much better. Um, however, there are medical and legal uh, <coughs> considerations, you know, that we must address after a brain injury. And uh, <clears throat> some of the medical considerations are changes in medical status uh, should be addressed before returning to driving. Medical conditions that should be assessed prior to driving after brain injury are as follows. One of the most important ones, of course, is vision. Visual spatial awareness, strength, coordination, range of motion, paralysis or weakness, abnormal muscle tone, sensory awareness, mobility, reaction time, and cognition. And these are all the elements that I assess in my driver assessment. So I'll get a referral from a doctor that someone uh, may be okay to go back to driving, let's check it out, and this is what I'll do in my evaluation. I do a clinical, then we go on the road and uh, <clears throat> go from there. So vision, in, in New Jersey, legal vision is 2050 in one eye, and there's no requirement for peripheral vision. But as everyone knows, it's very important, uh, we think it's extremely important to have peripheral vision and also depth perception. So I'll assess that in my clinical evaluation. Another component is visual spatial awareness, which includes figure ground, visual sequencing, visual memory, and visual completion. And we have a test called the MVPT, or Motor Free Visual Perceptual, and it takes all these components into uh, consideration. So it's not just vision, but it's how you perceive what you're seeing that we look at. <coughs> Some of the visual disturbances related to brain injury, of course, uh, are double vision, neglect. Neglect could be neglecting one side of your body, you know, and the visual field on that side, or um, <clears throat> there could be a partial field cut, and we'll look at that. Also, you could have impaired depth perception and impaired visual acuity. So. <clears throat> Assessment of vision and visual perception. The specialists that can do that, of course, are the ophthalmologist, neurooptometrist, an occupational therapist, or a certified driver rehab specialist who's been trained to assess this area. We also look at strength. And when we look at strength, it doesn't have to be, you know, strong, strong. It's just enough that you can uh, use the standard equipment on a car, steering, brake, and, uh, secondary controls. So we're looking at maybe uh, four, a uh, fair plus over good or three over five muscle strength. And that's done in the clinic before we go in the car. Um, <clears throat> we also look at coordination. Coordination is the combined activity of many muscles into smooth patterns and sequences of motion. So in the clinic I'll do some simple coordination tests. I'll also observe the patient uh, clients see how they do, because uh, that's, as you know, very important for driving. <clears throat> so I'm going to skip to uh, range of motion, which is something we assess in the clinic. And again, it doesn't have to be full active range of motion. It's just enough to reach the, uh, the standard equipment in a car. And if you don't have it, then we can introduce some adaptive equipment that might be able to allow you to drive with that limitation. <clears throat> 
So there's, there's um, you see suggested ranges that we look at. So 100 degrees of shoulder flexion. It doesn't have to be 180. And uh, the other ranges are, are there. And, and you can look at that. And that's, you know, just to make sure that you can reach the standard equipment of a car. Also, we look at cervical and trunk range of motion. Your neck, can you turn normal, like neck range of motion is 90 degrees, either direction and trunk the same. But we found if you have 160 degrees of combined neck and trunk range of motion, that's sufficient to back the car up. So that's what we look at. <clears throat> and if we, if you, we can also introduce additional mirrors if you don't have that range of motion. So, <clears throat> Another area that I would look at in a clinical evaluation would be paralysis or weakness. So the weakness could be one side of the body, it could be due to um, MS, lower extremity weakness, um, and then based on the extent of the weakness, we could also introduce adaptive equipment when we go in the car. So it's just because you have a weakness, you don't have to give up driving. Say so you're weak on one side, which could uh, happen after a stroke or brain injury. There's other ways that you can drive with adaptive equipment. So I'm on your side for that. And then we look at the tone, muscle tone. Can be low or high. And... Uh, <clears throat> You know, we must determine to see if that's going to interfere with their ability to operate a motor vehicle. Um, another important area that I look at in the clinic is sensory awareness. Um, normal sensation is required to drive a car. And we look at in the clinic, we look at light touch, sharp dull discrimination, proprioception, which is a joint sense. So um, <clears throat> I'll ask the patient, you know, I'll close your eyes and I'll bend their arm and elbow and tell me, is your elbow bent? Are your fingers pointing up? Is your ankle bent or straight? Which is very important for driving, of course. Um, <clears throat> and then stereognosis, which is uh, it's a tactile sense, which is important also. And then we look at the patient's mobility. Uh, can the client ambulate? You know, and if so, with what device? Can the client transfer into and out of a vehicle? Is the client in a wheelchair, a power chair? You still can drive from a power chair. I mean, that's a possibility. And the, can the client safely, safely stow their wheelchair? So even if they get to the car with a wheelchair, what do they do then? They have to stow it somehow. And there is equipment that can help with that. So. Next is reaction time, and I'm talking about uh, brake reaction time. How fast can the client get their foot from the gas to the brake? And I have a piece of equipment in the clinic that uh, <clears throat> looks at that. So brake reaction time tester, and the client has to respond to lights. Put the foot on the gas and a green light will come on. Randomly a red light comes on and they have to move their foot from the gas to the brake in a certain amount of time. Hopefully quick enough, you know. Um, another important component for driving is cognition, and we look, we look at uh, elements of cognition uh, including judgment, memory, reasoning, problem solving, abstract thinking, concentration, sequencing, reading, computation, and generalization of learning. What I look at in the clinic is their ability to follow simple and complex instructions, uh, ability to carry over learning from one day to the next and from the clinic to the car, their ability to attend to the task at hand, ability to follow several steps in a process, an ability to anticipate and understand cause and effect. Um, you know, if I accelerate, Right now, do I have time to get over to the next lane? That's the cause and then the effect. So they have to be able to understand that. Ability to plan a, a sequence of steps to complete a task, to problem solve, and to interpret signs and symbols.
That brings us to legal considerations prior to returning to driving. And there are, uh, first of all, you need medical clearance, and then if you're driving with adaptive equipment, there's other considerations that come into effect. So medical clearance comes from your doctor. Uh, in New Jersey, the physician is responsible for reporting to, to the motor vehicle any conditions that may impair driving. Um, your doctor will also advise you on taking medications in driving, what are the side effects and if it's safe. And so you should always ask your doctor, what do you feel, you know, how do you feel about me returning to driving? The next step might be, you know, go ahead, go back to driving or come to me for a, a driver assessment, you know, to see if you're still safe. The next slide is individuals who may report a driver to the Motor Vehicle Commission. This could be judges, police, concerned family members, healthcare professionals, and the driver can also self-report, which we'd love to see more, you know, more of that. But. Uh, medical clearance. It, I, here is this is an important slide because it lists the uh, medical conditions that may impair one's ability to drive. Um, convulsive and seizures, seizure disorder. That's a doctor has to report to the state if that's the case. I mean, there are uh, other conditions here, but it's kind of a gray area. If a doctor has a patient who has loss of coordination, but they're going through rehab, they might try to see what happens after rehab. Instead of reporting to the state and starting a whole uh, medical review, they'll see how the patient does in rehab and then, you know, go from there on that. But the other conditions are loss of co coordination, loss of muscle strength, loss of cognition, loss of vision and visual perception, and abnormal muscle tone, paralysis, or contracture. that leads to the uh, driving with adaptive equipment. Like I say, it is a possibility. Uh, the requirement in New Jersey is if uh, you're gonna drive with adaptive equipment, you have to pass their road test. You know, after you're done with rehab, you'll get your equipment and uh, they, want, they want to know what's on the road, if it's installed properly, and if you know how to use it safely. 